Thank you. So I'm delighted to introduce Flora Donald. Um, Flora's been a BSBI member for around 15 years, encouraged by her dad, um, which is brilliant. Her dad is VCR for um, West Ross, and he got her hooked on plant recording at an early age. Um, she started her career at Nature Scott, working on Uist, Barra and St Kilda, before taking on a PhD in ecological mod uh, modelling. Um, and she's now an ecosystems analyst with JNCC. So over to you, Flora. Hey, thanks, Julia, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to present to you today. It really is an honour. Um, I'm going to present some research that I conducted during my PhD, which was investigating the infection of UK juniper populations with Phytophthora ostracedri. So my PhD was a collaboration between UKCEH Forest Research and the University of Cambridge, um, and funded by all of the partners shown on the screen. And I'm really excited to share these results with you um, because none of this research would have been possible without records that you've all collected. There we go. Uh, so Phytophthora is a genus within the Oomycetes. So sometimes they're compared to fungi, but they're not true fungi. They are in the Chromista. So they're more closely related to brown algae. And Phytophthora literally means plant destroyer, and uh, most of the species are pathogenic. So probably the most famous one is Phytophthora infestans, which causes potato blight. Um, but I'm sure you've also heard of Phytophthora remorum, which uh, sometimes is called sudden oak death. It's caused the death of millions of trees in um, California and Oregon, and is now making it very difficult for us to grow larch in the UK. Um, so Phytophthora can spread uh, asexually and sexually. Um, but Phytophthora ostracedri that I'm going to talk about specifically, um, we think from the genetic analyses is only spreading asexually. And it does this by um, producing source. Oh, no. Sorry. I need to play the video. Uh, oh, good. So hopefully now you can see that there's um, zoospores being released from this structure here, which is the sporangium. So those spores are short-lived. Um, they're flagellate, so they can swim through soil moisture, and um, they could also be transported if infected soil is um, moved from one place to another. Um, and so unlike Phytophthora remora, we don't think that Phytophthora ostracedri can be wind dispersed at all. So this uh, slide gives you an, an idea of the impact that Phytophthora ostracedri causes when infecting juniper. So we start with, um, this picture here, this is a healthy juniper. And then you can see that this one here started to discolor. The foliage has gone quite yellow. And then unfortunately the tree dies um, and goes this very characteristic bronze color. And then the needles drop off and you're left just with skeletal juniper. And you can see that Phytophthora ostracedri can cause significant juniper, juniper mortality. So this is a population in Hawswater in the Lake District. Um, and you can see the infection is spread down this way and then is starting to infect um, juniper in the corner here. And the way that it does this is the zoospores uh, insist on the juniper roots and then the infection moves up into the phloem um, and it girdles the phloem so the tree can't take up any nutrients. And that's why you get this uh, effect where it's either whole stems or whole trees that die very suddenly. So the questions that I'm going to try and illuminate a bit for you today um, are which environmental factors are driving the establishment of ostracedry infection of juniper um, and are these factors do they differ when you're looking at the population scale versus the national scale and is there a relationship between the presence of the pathogen and where juniper has been planted oh sorry i moved on too far uh, so this is the distribution of Phytophthora ostracedri worldwide, and you can see that it's a bit strange. Um, it was first discovered in 2007 from Argentina, where it infects Ostracedris chilensis, or Chilean cedar. Um, and actually, they've seen die back in Chilean cedar since the 1940s. Uh, but Ostracedri is really slow growing, and it's really difficult to isolate, which is why it took so long to detect the causal agent. Um, so juniper in the UK is the only other wild tree population um, that's infected with the pathogen. And you can see that that's quite surprising given the wide global distribution of um, juniper. But we do know that ostracedri is being transported in the plant trade. So it's been detected on um, the species listed on the slide and it's been found in nurseries in uh, the UK, Germany, and was also detected on a 
a site for species that was planted in a public park in Iran. So Pantothrus rosedri was first discovered in juniper in the UK in 2012. Um, and you can see these are your records. So this is uh, juniper tetrads recorded since 1990, um, shown in blue. And then the distribution of ostracedri is shown by the red dots. So you can see that by the time we knew we needed to look for Phytophthora ostracedri, unfortunately, we found it was distributed throughout England and Scotland. And just a quick note about taxonomy. Um, so I reached out to several of you and asked whether you thought I should be um, modeling the impact of ostracedri on the different juniper subspecies. And the consensus was that actually the characters separating subspecies communists from subspecies nana are quite cryptic. Um, and so it, it was generally recommended to just look at communist sensulato. And lab experiments have shown that subspecies nana can also be infected. So there's no reason to suspect that ostracedri is, um, has different effects on the different subspecies. So although 1.8% of UK juniper tetrads infected doesn't sound like very many, you can see that unfortunately where there's most infection is in the, the real juniper strongholds in the Cairngorms and the Lake District. Um, and this is a real concern because we know that British juniper populations are declining from um, other impacts um, and it's a really important species for biodiversity because it supports so many generalist and specialist species and there's a component of so many different habitats. It's also one of our few native conifers that we um, use in native woodland creation. So the first thing I did was take a, a bunch of excellent volunteers out to um, look at uh, which environmental factors could be um, causing infection just at a site level. Uh, so I chose three different populations to explore. You can see they're quite geographically separate, but they also had different levels of infection. So um, potentially the population has been infected for different periods of time. And each population I collected about 50 10 by 10 meter quadrats and recorded loads of environmental variables. Um, so things like soil moisture, um, associated species growing in the quadrats, slope, altitude, distance to water courses, um, and also herbivory. So, you know, where we could see direct rising damage. I put those into generalized linear mixed models, um, which is just a kind of regression analysis to try and pinpoint um, which factors best explained the area of symptoms observed in the quadrats. And because the sites were also different, I was really expecting that um, different factors would prove to be important in uh, the different locations. But actually, in all of the models, um, there was increasing area of symptoms with increasing soil moisture. And when you think about soil soil dispersal, that kind of makes sense. But interestingly, um, when I added in the area of some particular associated species from the quadrats, and the model performance really improved. So in the Cairngorms, uh, increased area of Erica tetralix was associated with increased area of symptoms. I think that's because Erica tetralix is an indicator for really wet acidic microsites, and that seems to be where the pathogen uh, is able to establish first. And then in the Lake District, we found there was a decreasing area of symptoms with increasing area of brambles. And as Ian alluded to, I think that's probably because deer preferentially graze brambles. So where we were seeing lots of brambles in the quadrats, that means there was less browsing damage. And I didn't find any direct uh, relationship between herbivore damage and infection. So you think actually what's happening is just that deer and livestock um, are moving those infected soil particles around. So where there's fewer deer, um, there's less disease. So that was at the site level. And then um, we wanted to look at the national level and produce a risk map that could potentially help land managers um, risk assess for the disease and perhaps tailor their management. So I'll show you the results first. Um, so this was a different modeling technique. It was uh, using boosted regression trees, which is the machine learning algorithm. Um, and basically you feed it 80% of um, the ostracedry presences within tetrads and then um, all the environmental information and it outputs a, a prediction. And this number here is the voice index. It shows you how well the model is performing with the 20% um, of test data that's held back. So if that number was zero, it would mean the model's predicting um, ostracedry presence no better than random chance. Um, and if it's one, then it's, pre it's predicting the presence completely accurately. So I've just, um, this is the same risk map, but I've just kind of cut the threshold at different places. So it's a bit easier to see where the really significant um, predictions are. Uh, 
And so if you look at this one on the right, this is where um, ostracidary presence is suspected to be present um, at above 0 0.75, so very likely to be present. And you can see that it's mirroring what was actually observed quite nicely. So the models um, predicted presence of the pathogen in the Cairngorms and in the Lake District. But I'd like to draw your attention to some of the other locations. So the Pennines, Northumberland and Scottish borders in particular, the models predicting a lot of infection in these areas that we haven't observed yet. So we think those are the areas where ostracidary is most likely um, to next appear. So what caused that uh, prediction? Well, interestingly, actually it was soil pH predicted row deer density and mean daily rainfall were the best predictors of uh, ostracidary presence nationally. These graphs give an indication of the direction of the relationship. Um, so you can see soil pH is slightly difficult to interpret, but certainly by about pH 5.5, there's a decreasing relationship. So ostracidary definitely looks to be favoring very acidic soil types. And then there's increasing presence of ostracidary with uh, roe deer density, but unfortunately it's not quite that straightforward um, because this is uh, based on the habitat suitability index because uh, we don't have great information about deer distributions um, across the country. And so it's potentially a bit of confounding information in that something that was used to predict habitat suitability for roe deer was also included in my model and it's inflating the effect. But I think it's really interesting that these uh, national predictors really tie back to what we found with the plant species indicators um, in the microsites. And then finally, mean daily rainfall was a good predictor, um, but in perhaps the opposite direction to what you'd expect. So uh, there was increasing likelihood of ostracidary presence with lower mean daily rainfall. But actually, if you look back at the maps, that sort of makes sense in that where ostracidary has been found is sort of in the east coast where there tends to be slightly lower rainfall. There's a couple of theories about why that might be the case. I think my preferred one is that there's a temperature trigger that's required for that zoospore release from the sporangium. Um, experiments they've done at Forest Research have indicated that that might be the case. And although I did try and put lots of temperature variables into the national model, um, none of them, I think, quite captured um, that process. So you're very welcome to go and uh, explore a juniper tetrad near you and uh, see if you can see the probability of ostracidary presence and um, if you just go to this link here it will open up a shiny app in your browser and you'll be able to go and have a play around and um, but just a slight health warning that uh, this work hasn't been published yet so it might be subject to some changes following review and then the final thing I wanted to mention is that uh, when I was preparing the national model I reached out to lots of juniper stakeholders and asked them what they thought would predict ostracidary presence. And a large number of them suggested juniper planting, even though many of them were involved in planting juniper themselves. So juniper planting has widely been used as a conservation tool, um, really to try and reverse the population declines and also improve the structure of the existing juniper populations. And by planting really, I think, what mostly happens is that uh, cuttings are collected from sites and then they're taken elsewhere to be propagated. So that can be a commercial nursery or it can be a nursery held by an organization and that can be on site or um, somewhere central. And then the material once it's been propagated is planted back out on site to reinvigorate the populations. Um, and obviously that poses a risk because um, we know that phytophthora surgery is being circulated in trade um, and some nurseries might have stricter biosecurity practices than others. Some might be at greater risk because they're importing lots of different cedars and obviously um, ostracidary is very difficult to detect because it's microscopic and uh, is transported in the soil. So I started putting together maps of where juniper planting has been carried out. I was really surprised how much has been undertaken and started to wonder if that's why the UK is the only country um, where juniper is currently infected in the northern hemisphere, because we've done a lot more juniper planting than other countries that are, you know, less dependent on juniper. Um, so again, this is your data uh, with the native juniper shown in blue and then planting locations, some of which I took from uh, notes in your records um, shown in dark blue. And uh, I really wanted to explore the nuances and planting practices, but unfortunately, because the records uh, collection hasn't been standardized, and I didn't really have enough information. So you can go and read the paper um, and see some of the things that we were able to explore. And generally, I find that it looks like there was an increasing risk of ostracidary presence where large numbers of trees have been planted and more frequently. 
Sorry, Jim, am I overrunning? <laughs> um, I know you, you're fine. I just wanted to also mention uh, if we look here at the Boyce Index. So um, in the national map, um, I tried using different temporal slices of planting locations, and it didn't really make much difference uh, which time slice I included until I only included information from the past decade, and there the model performance dipped. So there is something about um, including all of the historical planting events that's better predicting the current distribution of Phytophthora cedri, uh, and I think that could foreshadow um, that we're going to see a lot more um, outbreaks of ostracedria in the coming decades if there's a bit of a lag between pathogen being introduced and it then being detected in the foliage symptoms. So the answers to the questions I asked at the beginning, um, if you are uh, looking for Phytophthora ostracedria and you don't think it's been detected yet, then the place to look at the site level is places with high soil moisture. And then at both scales, so whether you're um, trying to prioritise where to spend resources on juniper conservation nationally, um, or if you are interested in just site level management, then it's the soil pH and herbivory are, are possibly going to guide um, where the pathogen is most likely to establish. And in terms of supplementary planting, I find that there is some increased risk um, with planting. And I think before we can really assess the, the need for planting, it would be really useful to understand better if planting is delivering the desired benefits to the juniper populations. So I just want to say thank you to you all for um, all of your, your help and responding to emails very quickly. Um, and also if you are out in the field and you see something that looks like it could be uh, ostracid reinfection or indeed any other tree infections, then do please collect information to send to Tree Alert and somebody at Forest Research will get back in touch with you um, to try and look for a diagnosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flora. That was really fascinating. That, brilliant. Jim, would you like to ask the first question? Yes, uh, one thing that was in my mind, uh, my vice county has uh, Glenartney juniper wood, which I'm deliberately not visiting because I'm worried about uh, spreading it. And David Elson asked a, a question about the, the, that issue. What, biodiverse, uh, what biosecurity measures should we take if we come across infected plants in the field? I think if you're coming across infected plants in the field, it's probably too late. Um, so what we should all be doing is, is cleaning our boots. Um, so really making sure that you're not uh, transporting any soil or plant material from one side to another and just getting in the habit of cleaning your boots every time that you come back from the field. Yeah. Uh, particularly for a soil-borne pathogen, once it's there, it's very difficult to stop it from spreading. So we've really got to try and shut down those introductory pathways. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Julia? and we've got, we've got a few questions about um, correlations. So was there any link um, to um, altitude um, or um, what's the other one? Um, between pre presence, of, uh, presence of surrounding land use, such as commercial forestry or farmland, did you find any links there? So altitude I did always uh, include. And I think the effects were quite marginal. Um, maybe in the national model, it was one of the better predictors, um, but I wasn't sure if that was just confounded where, with where most juniper is on an altitudinal scale. Um, and surrounding land use, I don't think I really included that um, very well. That, that is a an, yeah, an interesting point. Um, so I did look at things like recreational pressure, kind of population density. Um, yeah, but land use is a bit harder to include in the models um, because it's a factor. So that it, it sort of reduces the number of other things you can explore. But yeah, a bespoke study on that would be interesting. Thank you. Um, are, are there any other practical steps we can take um, short of um, be more circumspect about planting juniper um, and trying to control deer to re uh, halt the spread of uh, the disease. Um, there certainly are. Uh, so if I go back to my presentation, and why am I having trouble? Here we go. <laughs> this 
slide is uh, basically a summary of what I put in my PhD discussion, which is a whole host of um, different things that different people could undertake. Um, and a lot of it is is to do with just trying to shut down spread pathways. Um, but there's practical things, you know, about um, if there's footpaths that are going through juniper populations and they're at high risk microsites, then maybe it might be worth diverting them. Um, drainage is something you could do preemptively. You definitely couldn't do it if the pathogen's already present, because I think one of the problems at Glen Artney is that they did some drainage and unfortunately just moved a whole load of infected soil right the way around the site. Um, so yeah, it's about risk assessing on a case by case basis. Brilliant. Thanks, Laura. Okay. That, Thank that you. Really good. 